All right, thank you so much for everybody that is tuning in today. We are here with our Secretary Treasurer, Robert Keenan, who's going to be talking to us about the fish bargaining process and the price reconsideration. Robert, thank you for joining us. Thank you for hosting me. <laughs> All right, Robert, you can uh, jump in there and talk a little bit about what's going on. Okay, so uh, we obviously hear what's going on, uh, you know, amongst our membership and concerns with uh, the current price and when are we going for reconsideration and whatnot. So we thought we would put together a presentation to give it a good overview of, of the process, uh, why uh, the process goes the way it does, what kind of information that we need to, in order to uh, be successful with the pro, uh, process and, and so on. But I guess before we get into that, I think it's important to be a little clear on how we ended up where we are. So we have a price of 573 and when that was originally announced, everybody seemed quite happy with that price and, and that that was good. Now we subsequently found out that the price in Nova Scotia was higher, uh, to what degree higher, we're still trying to figure that out, but it looks like at least $7 and maybe more. Uh, so that's obviously a concern to us and we wanna make sure that our harvesters here are getting paid uh, basically in the same range as the Nova Scotian harvesters or, or New Brunswick harvesters as well. The, when we were at negotiations this year, we had three uh, market reports, one for Japan by Meros Consulting. And that report basically said that Japan wasn't going to be competing for snow crab in the same way as it was in the past because the price has gone too high. Then we had a report from Gemba Consulting who provides us with reports for shrimp on a, uh, three times a year. And his report right at the beginning said that he thought that prices were going to stay the same uh, as they stood at that time. Uh, for the next couple of months and then decline. And then the last report we had was from John Sackton, who said that the uh, market was good, but he wouldn't commit to a price increase or a price decrease. He basically, the impression I, that we got from it was that the prices were going to stay within the same band that they currently were in, which was a record high at that time. So we based our price around, uh, around those, that information that we had and the export numbers that we had and so on. We also do talk to processors in Nova Scotia to find out you know, what are they thinking and price wise and the information that we got from the processors that we talked to that are friendly with us uh, said that they anticipated the price to be at $6 when the season started. And if you look at 573 in Newfoundland and compare that to $6 in Nova Scotia, it's pretty close because in Nova Scotia, it's the responsibility of the harvester to pay CPP and EI. So you add 20, 20, 20 odd cents to the 573 and you're getting uh, price for Newfoundland harvesters that's very close to the Nova Scotia harvesters now. That didn't turn out to be the case. And now we're in a situation where Nova Scotia is uh, paying more and we have to figure out, we're well, not figure it out, but we have to approach, uh, approach the process that we have in this province in such a manner that we can ensure that Newfoundland Labrador harvesters get the best return on snow crab. So do you wanna bring up the presentation, Elise, please? Today is a price reconsideration in the fish price collective bargaining process. And we're going to go through, you know, several different aspects of this. Lise, do you want to cut to the next slide, please? So here's what we're going to be talking about. Basically, who can get a reconsideration because it's not an open process, obviously. Uh, what can or trigger reconsideration? So there are certain standards that have to be met in order to actually get a reconsideration, and that's important. Uh, the requirements of a reconsideration and then the reconsideration process itself. So for getting a reconsideration, only the parties to the negotiations are able to get a reconsideration. So right now, essentially that's ASP, the Association of Seafood Producers and the FFAW. We're the only ones that are allowed to apply for reconsideration because we are the certified bargaining agents under the Fishing Industry Collective Bargaining Act. So if there was an independent plant who is subject to the price, if they wanted to get a reconsideration, they would not be able to do so. If there's a fishing organization, uh, that would not be able to get a reconsideration either because the fishing organization wouldn't be certified under the uh, under the Fishing Industry Collective Bargaining Act, would have no capacity for negotiations and would have no ability to be in the room when negotiations are happening. So that group also would not qualify uh, to trigger a reconsideration. The other thing is the panel can only reconsider a price decision made by the panel. So what this means is that if there's an agreement between the parties the panel cannot reconsider an agreement. So if we shake hands, that is the price for the season. There's no way to get out of that price, get out of that price. And that's, that obviously raises the stakes for uh, agreements because you know when that agreement's in place, it can't be changed. So if the market goes up or the market goes down, 
uh, you are basically taking on all the risk in that handshake and, and you're stuck with whatever you have in place. So that's an important point to have in mind because I think there was some people uh, that were advocating for us to, to shake hands at 550 uh, at the, the original uh, round of negotiations. And if we had done that, uh, we would be stuck at the price of 550 for the entire season. So, uh, Elise, can you click it two more times, sorry. This is the basically when you can apply for a reconsideration. So you can apply for a reconsideration when the failure to do so would jeopardize the conduct of the fishery to which its decision applies. And that's fairly broad there when you look at it. But then if you go down to four, uh, section four, it allows the minister to make certain regulations. And 4A says, respecting the criteria which the panel shall consider in determining whether the conduct of the fishery to which a decision applies is in jeopardy under subsection three. Next slide. And click it again twice. So here is the main point uh, for getting a reconsideration. So in determining whether the conduct of the fishery to which its decision applies is in jeopardy under subsection 19.14.3 of the act, the panel shall consider whether market or currency factors have changed significantly from the time the panel made its initial decision. So the key here is market or currency changes, significant changes in market and currency. And that is what has to be proven in order to justify getting a reconsideration. So the term jeopardy doesn't apply to whether people are going to go fishing or not. That doesn't create uh, jeopardy or whether the buyers are going to buy or not. That wouldn't create jeopardy on its face. It's basically if currency changes or the market changes. And that is what is important. So currency is pretty straightforward. You know, if we have a significant increase or decrease in, decrease in currency, those can be seen pretty much right away. And you could go in and get a reconsideration on that. So last April, for example, when COVID really started to get very bad in the world, the Canadian dollar weakened very quickly against the US dollar. And if we had been fishing at that time, that would have triggered a reconsideration, but we were not. In snow crab, which is the concern of most people at the moment, uh, there is a currency provision. So uh, currency doesn't factor into getting a reconsideration because our price adjusts as the currency goes up and down. Market is the key point that we're dealing with right now. And this is not a straightforward issue. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of confusion about it. And hopefully this will help set it straight. So the market for fish price setting is the point where the processors sell our product to a whole, wholesaler, wholesaler or directly to a grocer or restaurant. So a lot of our stuff allegedly ends up in Red Lobster. So that is the market we're talking about. And that's the point where the processor makes its money. And what we want there is a share of that return. That is, the sh that is the share of the market that we are trying to seek. So that is the market that we're looking at. And that's, that's what we have to figure out is what's the value of that market as it currently stands. Recently, we had a hearing uh, on lobster. And one of our main arguments was that a lobster buyer who is just flipping lobster to another processor or something to, to, to export or, or to actually process is not actually the market. They are not engaged in the market. Uh, they are basically agents. And that's a key point there. So if we have, if we're dealing with people in the, in the crab sector, and I don't know if we are, who are just purchasing it for a set price and then flipping it off to somebody else, they wouldn't necessarily be dealing with the market, only the person who's actually selling into that market, selling into the wholesaler or into the, the grocer or restaurant. The other thing that is not the market and it doesn't help us with deciphering the market is grocery store prices. So there is some relationship between grocery store prices and the market, but where, where, the, where the market that we are concerned about is factored into the price of the grocery store is very unclear. So if you look at this uh, chart we have or table we have here, you see there, this is sort of the, uh, an approximation of you know, who adds to the price of a product going into the going into the grocery store. So you have the harvester taking out a chunk and buyer, shipper, distributor, and retailer. And if you look at there, the harvester and the retailer trunk, chunks are the two biggest ones there. So, but how much of a markup actually occurs at retail, we don't know. It could, you know, it could be an incredibly high markup because they received it at a cheap price, but we're able to sell it at a high price or it could be a very small markup. So 
going to the market, the grocery store and picking out a, a, you know, a piece of fish or, you know, crab legs or something and saying, oh, this is a indicative of a high market is, is probably true, but being able to use that information uh, as a, as a help to, to go back to the panel for reconsideration, it, it doesn't exist. The other thing that's clear is that the price paid to the harvester is not the market. And we need to be very clear on that because that's part of the frustration that exists right now. And I think last year is the best example of that. Last year, harvesters in this province re received 350 a pound. And the real market, the one we knew that actually exists was far, far higher. So we, you know, to say that the price to the harvester is indicative of the market requires us to ignore what happened last year where we knew that the price of the harvester was not indicative of the market. And so the challenge that we're having this year and what we had last year too at the beginning of the season is that uh, this in most years we have a good idea of what the market is and then we build a price around that market. So this year when we had our market reports and we had the earner value price of of 990 that was there, we could look at that and say, okay, well, wh where do we think the market's going to be in relation to those numbers? And we could come up with a price to harvesters. Right now, all we have is a price to harvesters and we're trying to come up with a market figure from that. And that's not as straightforward uh, as having, as uh, understanding the, the market as it is and building off a price from that. So we're trying to construct an overall market from a, fish, from a price to fish harvesters. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not as easy. So, as I just said, so. Do you want to click uh, two more times? So here's the other thing for the reconsideration is that each party may make only one reconsideration application respecting the panel's decision on a species in a year. And that's key. Do you want to go to the next slide, please, Lisa? Because the, the, the key point here is only one reconsideration application. And there are two steps to a reconsideration. One is the application and the other one is the reconsideration hearing. So when we make our application, we have to put down why the basis, the foundation of why we think a reconsideration should be heard. If the panel is not swayed that this is enough to justify a hearing, they can actually deny the application straight out. And once you deny that application, that is your one reconsideration chance and it's gone. So you have one, re you have one shot at this and you have to be able to, to clear two two hurdles. First is getting the application accepted by the panel. And then the second one is getting your price, uh, your price uh, position accepted by the panel. So usually getting the application heard is easy, uh, or not easy say, but it's uh, more straightforward. Um, but the panel has in the past, and we've been a part of these, has rejected applications for reconsideration, and that has burned the party's reconsideration option on that species. So a lot of this, therefore, because we only have one chance at this, depends on timing and evidence, and both of those should be linked. So if you apply before adequate evidence, the impact of the reconsideration could be very little. And when we look at this, we say, okay, we wait until we have enough solid evidence to support a strong case to the panel, and then we go. Not a moment later than that, as soon as we have that, we go. Uh, because the panel is going to make its decision based on evidence. And if you go to the panel with no evidence or very poor evidence, you're going to be in trouble and chances are you're not going to be successful and it's going to be a wasted effort. So what is good evidence? And this is another thing that came out over the last few weeks because we have asked harvesters to, to provide whatever they may have um, for, uh, you know, on that. And uh, I think it's important that they do, but when we're talking about evidence, we're talking about basically documents, facts, things that are unimpeachable, and things that, that ASP is not going to look at and say, well, that's a joke, or I can just call the other person up and get a, a, an alternate opinion that basically undercuts our entire position. So ASP always challenges the credibility of our evidence, and we always challenge the credibility of their evidence. So you want evidence that is not going to collapse under some good, uh, under some strong scrutiny. And so basically the, the ones that we uh, like to have, obviously export numbers, now that doesn't work in a reconsideration because of a time lag. That's usually six weeks after the end of a month. So for April's export numbers, we'd have to wait until the middle of June and that doesn't work for us. Market updates, earner berry, we talk a lot about earner berry, earner current is another one that has market 
reports as well, not for snow crab, but for their species. And these are basically industry accepted uh, indicators of what the market currently is. And we use Arner Barry for everything. And in, in crab, we have never used we have never had a reconsideration that did not use Erner Barry. We have always used it because it is the clearest argument for where the market currently is. Then we also have market reports from widely used consultants. So that's something, you know, we would, whether it would be Gemba or John Sackton or somebody like that, whether they've been good or bad in the past is, well, it's not irrelevant, but at least when they provide us information, it adds an air of authority to it about what the market actually is. Trade articles. So we, you know, people have been sending me articles on, you know, reports of what the prices are to harvesters and so on and so forth. So that all helps build part of the case. And if you had a tr trade article that cited a market price, so cite a price to market right now of snow crab at 11.50 US or something like that, that would be wonderful. That would, you know, that would basically prompt us to go right away because we would have something in black and white telling us what the market actually is. The other one that helps is uh, statements or emails from processors on price. So we do have some of that. Uh, processors have come to us and what they're paying harvesters uh, in Nova Scotia that we've talked to and and I've heard from harvesters in the province about what they're hearing on uh, on prices in Nova Scotia and all that is helpful but it's again that is a price to the harvester and not the market price so it only has it's 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 not the home run ball that they are hoping for when you're when you're looking for establishing a market uh, the other one would be if we had a significant number of harvester receipts that show a consistent price. So if we had a lot of receipts that showed $7, $7.58. We could say that this was not a one-off. This is not necessarily a function of a price war or something like that, that this is the standard that, that's applied. And we would hope that that would, uh, you know, we could get that, but I understand we've always had a challenge getting receipts from harvesters. It's, it's just the nature of the business. People don't like to disclose that information. That's fine. Uh, but if we had that, that would help a lot in going forward. The other one would be a receipt from a processor to a wholesaler. I've never seen one of these. Uh, it would be very, very difficult to get. It would require essentially probably somebody, uh, you know, working within a processor or wholesaler disclosing that over to us. What is also important to understand is what is poor evidence. So when people are, are saying, use this evidence, use this evidence, I, I'm just going to be honest and say, like, these are, this is the evidence that is not is not going to get us there. Uh, and basically anything from Facebook, if the ever evidence is on Facebook, it is really of no value to us. And I'll be blunt on that. Uh, actually, if we had to use Facebook evidence, it would more hurt our cause than help it. Because if you're using Facebook, it shows that you're desperate and you don't have anything else to use. So Facebook, anything on Facebook, Facebook posts, whatever, are not helpful in the least. And uh, you know, just, just so everybody is aware of that. Again, grocery store prices, pictures of what they're paying or what you're being charged in the grocery store for a crab or any other species, not going to, uh, not going to move the needle with the panel whatsoever. Verbal statements. So if you heard from somebody who heard from somebody else about what they're paying here, you know, that is hearsay. Uh, and while we don't have strict rules of evidence at the panel, it's easy to poke a hole in those kind of statements and it will be very hard to put that in front of it. I also would say that any encouragement from a processing company that the FFAW go seek a reconsideration is not good evidence. If the processor company is coming to you and saying this, then uh, that is a warning sign more than anything else. So as I said here, processing companies are not your friends and they do not have your best interests in mind. And that is true. And what we are seeing now, and I've heard it several times already this morning, getting ready for this uh, presentation, is that processing companies are going out saying FFAW is going to go tomorrow or FFAW is doing this and FFAW is doing that. Well, FFAW has not made up its mind on any of that kind of stuff yet. And any rumors to the contrary are just that, they're rumors. And uh, I can tell you now that they're false. And of course, it's in the best interest of the processing company to encourage us to go right now because they know what the, the market information that's available. They know that it might not be as, it might be, in their best interest for us to go now and make a case that's not as strong as we could. Uh, they know all of that and they would want us to obviously make that to move forward like that and, uh, you know, basically get a price that's not the full value of what we could achieve if we waited a little bit longer. And also they want you on the water. So we've heard from a lot of people who are not going fishing, understanding that a, a price reconsideration is most likely coming and they're waiting out for a better price and that's great. 
I hope, you know, it's a good approach to doing things. And I, that's probably having an impact on the amount that is being processed in this province and the amount that is being shipped out. So that's, that's the other challenge there as well. So they're also hoping, you know, trying to convince you that we're going to be going to the panel in this day or whatever in order to get you back on the water. And I can tell you now that there's no decision, no firm decision set on that. So the other thing, the importance of it is that like usually the party with the least amount of evidence at a reconsideration loses. And that's, that's, just the, that's just the facts of it. I mean, I've been involved in enough of these now to know that whoever comes in with the worst evidence usually ends up the worst for wear out of the whole thing. So, and even if you do win, if you go in and you do have good, uh, better evidence on the other side, but it's still not good evidence, then your, your win can basically not turn out to be that way. Uh, last year, for example, we had that really low price at 290 and everybody was pushing for us to go do the re reconsideration, do the reconsideration. And we had enough evidence to get that price changed, but we didn't have enough evidence of what the market was going to be. So we ended up going in right away and we did win at the panel and the price did go up. But, you know, two and a half weeks later, we got more information that came out and the price, they'll show that the price should have been significantly higher. So, you know, we went in at a price of 350 for a reconsideration and we won and that was great. Everybody at the time got the fish for 350. Uh, you know, if you waited two and a half weeks later, you get a price of $4. So, I mean, like that's, that's the, the balancing act that we're trying to, trying to manage here is that, you know, you want to get the best information that you can um, in order to, to get the best price that you can, but you also got to account for people's needs and people when people are going to be going fishing and so on. So that's, that's the balancing act. Two more clicks, Elise. So here's how it works, and this is important because when when we when there is a reconsideration, there's a 96-hour timeline, and it's the key word there is from the time the panel has acknowledged receipt of an application for reconsideration. Do you want to just go to the next? So basically, uh, they the the clock starts at when they acknowledge it. So what would happen is if we went for a reconsideration uh, today, for example, if we, we follow the reconsideration at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon, and then usually by five or six o'clock in uh, that afternoon, so an hour or two hours later, we would get an acknowledgement from the panel that they have received our, our application. And at that point, the 96 hour timeline moves. So then usually within six to 18 hours after that, we'll get uh, knowledge from the panel uh, or acknowledgement by the panel whether they're going to hear our reconsideration or not. So that, and that sometimes has gone longer. Sometimes it's gone 24 to 36 hours. So once they set, once they've agreed to hear our reconsideration, then they set a new time and date for the hearing. So when we do this, when, when, once there's a new hearing set, basically it just sets the original panel process up all over again. So it's a whole new panel hearing, all the rules and procedures that apply in your original plan, panel hearing apply on this, this new one, except for you're in a much more condensed uh, time frame. Uh, <clears throat> the panel also will want us to go and renegotiate with ASP. They, so they, they do encourage us to go and meet and try to come, come up with some sort of compromise or at least narrow down the issues. Uh, and we do try to do that. And sometimes we do, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But for the most part, we do get focused on the panel because every time so far, uh, we've ended up going back to the panel and having the panel hear it again. So even though we, you know, there is a, an attempt to renegotiate uh, that has never been successful in my, my history with the, with the FFAW. So this is just to give you a, a broad outline of what the uh, timeline is for, for how this works. So basically zero hour is when we submit the application and then it is acknowledged by the panel. And then hour six to 12 is basically the panel figuring out whether it's going to agree to have the hearing or not. And if the panel decides it's not going to have, not going to listen to the reconsideration, then the application is just dead. And there's no further reconsideration that can be submitted by that party for that species. So if you go in, you would know basically within half a day whether you're actually going to get a, a hearing in front of the panel. And if you don't, uh, it's, it's done. Uh, and then the price that's there will stay there unless the processors go in and try to get it changed. So basically from hours 12 to 60, you try to conduct a new round of negotiations with ASP. And then at the same time, hours 12 to 72, you're drafting a new submission to the panel. And 
and I don't know if people really understand the, the work that goes into drafting a submission for the panel. This is not something that you just kind of bang out uh, in a couple hours. We just, uh, our CRAB uh, panel or CRAB submission earlier on this year was 23 pages, single space. It's a lot of writing, it's a lot of editing, it's a lot of putting numbers together and thinking about different approaches and so on and so forth. It's not something that's simple. It requires some very strong writing uh, skills and, and strong editing skills. For Lobster, we had our, our submission to the panel was 36 pages, I believe. So the, these are comprehensive documents. You don't go in taking anything for granted here. You want to cover off all your bases. So then in hour 72, we submit the FFAW proposal to the panel. And, and then in hour 72, we will also then get the ASP submission. So we, we swap submissions on hour 72, roughly hour 72. And then from hour 72 to 84, we're basically preparing our arguments to the panel, and then we're also reviewing the ASP submission and preparing points for rebuttal. So how a panel hearing works is one side presents its submission, the other side presents its submission, then the other side presents its rebuttal, and then the person who went first goes last and presents their rebuttal. And that's, that's how it works. So we do get a chance to rebut the points, and it's important that we're very prepared for what they have, because sometimes ASP will put in things that uh, maybe, um, uh, you know, playing or exaggerating certain facts or, or ignoring other facts that are important to point out and so on and so forth. So we always have to be clear and, and make sure our rebuttal is strong and well put together. And then we have a panel hearing about an hour 84 and the panel hearing usually goes on depending on who's engaged in it, it usually goes on from three to four hours. So after that point, you know, our role in this basically ends and then it'll be up to the panel. The panel will be making its decision and they'll have to release a decision by hour 96. And that's, that's legislative and they can't get around that. And so what's the panel going to make its decision on? So when the panel, the panel's rules of procedure, and this is very important, the panel will base its decision on market conditions related to the fishery concerned to determine prices and or conditions of sale. And so that's the key point, they're market conditions. And we always need to be clear that the market plays the central role in this. And if we don't have the best evidence for the market, then uh, the work, then, then your application is not as good as it should be. So that's why I, you know, why people are getting impatient and stuff uh, on, you know, when are we going to go for reconsideration and whatnot. We, we need to go when we have the market information because it's, that's the, the key point in all of this. Uh, the other thing is when you're in an oral argument, you can't, uh, make any more additions to your submission. So you're, you're, you're basically bound by your written submission that you, you gave, you know, a few hours earlier. So you can't come in here and then somebody gives you a, a slip of paper, you know, right before the hearing that says, oh, uh, you know, got a new market report says prices of, of lobster is going to, or of crab is going to be $10 a pound and the market is, is uh, $15 a pound. You can't do that. Once you've submitted your, your submission, then basically all the evidentiary window closes and you can't go in and, and hijack the process. You can't go in and provide any new information. So this, one of the things that has been uh, asked is when is the new price valid? So the new price, if there is a new price will be effective as of the date and time set by the panel. And usually that's within one to two hours after the panel decision, or it might be at the exact time of the panel decision, they might say this price comes into effect immediately. One of the issues that we've always been, you know, people talked about is the retroactive component of this. And so we, we've heard a lot of concerns that, well, you know, this price is not gonna be retroactive, so why not? I and mean, it should be retroactive and why not? And there's a real basic logic to this, and I'll, I'll explain it clearly in a second, but. If the price is retroactive to harvesters, it would also have to be retroactive to the processor. And we can't think of any compelling reason to say why we could argue to the government that it should be otherwise. Because if obviously, if they have, if there is a, if the market price is too high for processors, then they're taking losses. If it's too low for harvesters, then they're taking losses. So this is the thing to consider. And this is why retroactivity is, is a difficult issue, but it's really hard to actually make a price retroactive. And just consider 2019, and this is the best example of this. So in 2019, the price, the initial price was 537, and we landed about 25 million pounds at that price. At that point, the processors went in 
and got the price lower to 495. And according to the processors, they had been losing money up until, uh, you know, you know, basically the entire season up until they got the 495 price, but they had to wait until they had the evidence there in order to get the reconsideration. And then we went in for a reconsideration a few weeks later because the market went up a little bit again and we got the price back up to 507. But the question here would be is, if the price was retroactive, then anybody who landed crab at 537 would essentially owe the processing company's money at 495 or even at 507. So we wouldn't ever want the price to be retroactive against the harvesters because it would, well, first of all, I don't think it's fair. Second of all, it would create an awful, awful mess. So, you know, this is, the, this is basically the example of why retroactive prices pricing wouldn't work because it has to work for both sides. And then both sides would essentially be in a tangly mess trying to pay back each other when prices go up and down. And so that basically that's what we're saying here is we will never agree to a price system that could result in harvesters having to pay processors back for price changes. And that is, you know, we can't do that. That would be just too complicated and it's wrong. And there's, and you're dealing with all sorts of considerations on what is the actual market and, you know, when did it change and so on and so forth. So we can't get into that. And that's the challenge with making the price retroactive. And so what, you know, what can you do right now? And this, people are calling me and they're saying, you know, tell us what to do, what, what should we do here with this? And there's several things that you can do. First of all, keep providing us with the information. You know, uh, we've received some, I'm sure we could receive more. If people have more information to, to send along, great. What we would advise against, if you're on Facebook and saying, I know where all this information is, but I'm not going to disclose it, or they have the information or they should have the information or whatever, it, then you are basically saying that you know where this information is. And if you know where that is, send it along so we can use it. You'll be doing a great service to your, to your fellow harvesters and you'll be doing a disservice if you didn't. So, you know, that's, that's the point there is we're not asking for help because uh, we just want to for something to do or something like that. We're asking for help because we spend a lot of time in the, at this work and a lot of time looking into things and a lot of time beating, beating every bush, trying to figure out whatever information we can. And, you know, sometimes you, you just need a little bit more help to get that information that you need. And that's basically what we're, we're asking for. I think that's the responsible thing to be doing on our end. The other thing is you can always tell your processor to pay more if they want you to fish. And this is, this is the, the annoying part of this because right now we're in such a way that we have no competition in this province. So basically the companies are saying, well, get the process, get the FFAW to go back and get a reconsideration and I'll pay you more. Well, that's not true actually, because we negotiate minimum prices and the whole concept of this is based on wharf competition. So if they want you to fish so badly, they should be offering you more money to get on the water and go fishing. And that's the right thing to do. So, you know, uh, they, they, by them putting it on us saying, oh, well, it's the union's job to get a reconsideration. No, it's actually the processor's job to live up to its responsibility of by owning a processing license to be competitive in how it operates. And so if it wants to be competitive, it should get a higher price for, fit, for the fish harvester. And that's just, that's just common sense. So, you know, I've heard a lot about people saying this and Andy Sullivan's telling me this and Andy Sullivan's telling me that. Well, what Andy, Andy Sullivan should just say, Bob, we're going to pay a higher price because that's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's none of his business when the uh, fish company or when the FFW goes in for a, uh, a fish price reconsideration. The other thing, and we're hearing more of this, is, you know, assess whether you can, uh, for, you know, from a fishing financial and safety perspective, delay fishing. So if you don't need to go fishing this week or you don't need to go fishing today or whatever, and you can hold off for a little while, uh, then you know, and, and wait till the, till we get a reconsideration in and work. Great. And if you can't, that's fine. You know, like we can't, I'm not going to punish people for wanting to go fishing or anything like that. That's, it's your livelihood and it's important and you make sure you want to do it safely and you want to do it at a timely manner. And that's great. The only thing I will point out is that last year we didn't start until May 11th and everybody landed their stuff. And whether that was a fluke or whatnot, uh, it still worked. And so I'm not going to tell people to not go fishing, go fishing if you want to, but if you, if you are able to delay uh, because you can uh, and you want to wait for a better price, then do so. And so, and this is, you know, I don't usually end with these sort of uh, sayings, but I think this is, this is really important here. 
And I guess it takes less time to do a right thing than it does to explain why you did it wrong. And so if we can go in and do this reconsideration the right way and the price comes up, then that'll be good and everybody will go back to some, a normal uh, fishing season and everything will work out okay. If we don't do this right, if we go in and we still get a really low price and Nova Scotia prices you know, are still way higher than our prices, we're going to be living with that for basically right up until negotiations next year. And we're going to be struggling with that and figuring out, you know, what did we lose? So give us the, be patient. And I know that's a lot to ask for, but you know, what we just ask is that have a little faith that we can get this done. We've done it right in the past. We'll continue to do it right. We pay a lot of attention to it. We're very careful with it and we're good at it. When we go to the panel, we win much more than we lose. So please just keep that in mind. We're here. This is, you know, on our minds all day long. And I dream about this at night now too. So this is the, this is what we're trying to get done. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, sooner rather than later, we will have that market information to go in for a better price. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robert, for taking time. I know uh, it certainly is very busy at our offices or our temporary offices right now. Um, and there's a lot of folks that are working really hard day and night, including Robert, to make sure that the harvesters are getting uh, a fair price and the price that they deserve. So thank you so much, Robert. And that's it for our series on the price negotiation reconsideration. Bye. <laughs>